Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I, I said I don't want to, or we, we talked about not speaking about happiness, but about unhappiness, uh, or uh, sometimes about the things that, that don't work. Um, and, and I think uh, it's, it's always a difficult uh, thing to speak at a conference like this, um, because I think there, um, th there's always the danger of consensus. Um, and the consensus uh, seems to make everything look fine, uh, even if the message is negative. Um, and somehow the question is, is really, um, what, what do we want and, and what do we need? Um, I want to talk about Asia, but I want to talk a bit about, uh, in, in general, um, about three, three different scales or three different issues, uh, those of cities, communities, and entities. Um, to, to try to define the city is an elusive thing, uh, one that um, too many things can be said about it. Um, but in, in a way, one of the things I, I quite like is to, to really think of the city um, as a place uh, where humans um, interact with each other at various degrees of intimacy, um, but also uh, as a place where you have the chance to remain anonymous. And maybe particularly this, this sense of being anonymous is one that uh, you could read in stark contrast with um, everything so happily uh, presented here as um, the data uh, that become available about us, about what we do, um, about how we live, um, and that can make it so incredibly convenient for us uh, to live, maybe even so incredibly efficient for us to live. Uh, but maybe also uh, sometimes uh, horrific in the sense of uh, that um, uh, a kind of very old sense maybe of being invisible or being anonymous um, is maybe also something very important that the city um, and the space that we inhabit together needs to offer. Um, if we look at cities, they, they obviously are very old. Um, civilization in, in the sense of, of cities is at, at least 5,000 years back uh, with the Ur city, if you like, Uruk, um, the oldest uh, remains of a city uh, still, um, still known to us. And um, if you look at the city, what is quite interesting that already in the, in the first stages um, of a city and the first stages of what maybe defines a city is the fact that um, a city is also about identity or is about places, buildings, um, and uh, um, an edifice in, an off in, in a city that indeed um, uh, becomes an identifier um, and an identity for both the city or the, or the people that uh, live there. Um, today called Xi'an, Chang'an, um, one of the other oldest cities uh, in, in China. And what is quite interesting here is that if you look at this plan, you see how um, rational systems um, have formed um, the basis of cities quite early on. The grid uh, as an extremely efficient uh, sense of structure to organize and, and administer uh, a city. Probably still the, the most um, exciting and amazing cities of uh, historic age uh, is, is Rome. It was indeed the first mega city. Um, imagine uh, a city that thousands of years ago had over a million inhabitants already then. So we realize that the, the problem of the big city is actually not entirely new. It, uh, uh, it already existed then. And why did Rome so successfully manage to grow a city beyond, far beyond all scales of cities that existed before? Um, it had something to do with achieving density. Uh, it had something to do with understanding infrastructure uh, as a fundamental uh, issue of how to distribute things in a city. But it also had to do with the fact that understanding that a city doesn't ex exist only of infrastructure, but obviously also of entertainment um, on, on various degrees. Hollywood uh, very, very smartly understands that as well uh, and carries that forward. But a city is obviously also a place of expectations, of dreams, of excitement. And, and of memories. Um, and I think in, in that sense, uh, we, we have to comprehend the, the city not only as a system of efficiency. Um, city visions by um, us, the architects, uh, there, there have been many. 
Um, there has been a better idea for Paris uh, than what Paris actually is. Um, there were also great ideas for Berlin, um, how uh, Berlin should look like uh, as an uh, efficient and livable city. Um, a, a slightly more um, what you could now call humane concept um, by Frank Lloyd Wright to integrate uh, landscape and the city and a kind of uh, sense of green uh, and the city. Um, or really, if you like, some of the maybe most uh, visionary uh, moments of what cities uh, could have become in futuristic moments with the metabolists uh, in Japan um, and, and ideas of cities that could really uh, be far beyond uh, what we even um, are able apparently to imagine today. Um, England played a very important role uh, as well in imagining cities. Archigram, uh, end of 50s and in the 60s, I think for the first time kind of tried to uh, use the technology to really liberate the city um, in, a, in a somewhat fantastic way uh, and really started to understand the city as a network, as a network of um, um, infrastructures and opportunities that could be exploited in, in various degrees. And I think in that sense, maybe it was um, the first uh, instance of, uh, of a smart city as still, uh, I think, in, in some ways, we seem to talk about it. Uh, but obviously also here, uh, the, the idea of, of fantasy and expectation played a role. And I think it was that what made these models um, important and relevant because they were neither technocratic nor about pure distribution, but they had something to do with desire, maybe. Slightly more apocalyptic uh, visions uh, kicked in quite quickly, um, environmentalists exist not only for the past uh, 10 or 15 years, um, when Bucky Fuller thought we should um, protect New York uh, from itself um, and, and sort of uh, encase it. But uh, again, it was actually the, the film industry that, that probably offered the, the most um, exploitative and visionary moments of how uh, cities would uh, look like. Uh, from Fritz Lang uh, down to Blade Runner. But you can see that in a way the, the, the vision of the future city had, had always a very strong um, apocalyptic sense and in a way one that was somewhere between fantasy, desire and complete failure um, of any sense of what architects uh, might think or urban planners and environmentalists might think they're aiming for. City statistics, I don't want to uh, repeat again and again. Uh, you know more than 50% live in cities. Um, you know that uh, obviously China and India are the places that build more cities than an anybody else. Um, but still uh, interesting to realize again and again is that um, the, the actual um, efficiency of cities um, is far greater uh, in, in the context of poverty than in the context of consumption. Um, and while we all strive to be so sustainable, if we would all live slightly more humble, we would be so much more sustainable than any uh, more efficient uh, city or uh, transport or air conditioning system can, can provide. And I think uh, even back to the question that, that Muk asked, do we really always need to build new buildings and what are we building for? Or what are we improving our standard of life for? I think remains at the core uh, of the question of what sustainability actually stands for. There have been many great projects and great models. Um, uh, a lot of them um, of the new so-called eco-cities, um, not in Europe, because it's obviously a bit difficult to uh, completely turn around um, existing cities. We've heard before that uh, London will, in 100 years, still grapple with the same basic uh, physical configuration um, as now. That is probably true, but obviously there are parts of the world um, that uh, both create and imagine entirely new systems for cities. But if we look at the reality of it, one, one of the uh, most hyped and, and uh, famous examples was Dongdan outside Shanghai, a city that uh, promised to be a carbon footprint positive, uh, produce more energy and be so much better for everybody. If we look at the reality of it, um, unfortunately, uh, something happened uh, politically and this city uh, never happened uh, either. Um, there's another great example that is even featured in the exhibition out here. Um, uh, there was the extremely sustainable idea to build a city out in the middle of nowhere in the desert. Um, and the starting point uh, seemed um, very promising uh, and 
sort of unidentifiably uh, complex and glamorous, uh, but obviously also this city so far hasn't quite gone anywhere. Um, another good example is um, a great uh, green uh, carbon city project that was uh, planned as shown above and built as executed below. Um, so we, in China, we, we, so we, we realize, we realize uh, that everything we're talking about um, is, is great in many ways, uh, but maybe still quite far away from reality. And part of the question is, why is that? If it all makes so much sense and if it's all so clear and, and good, why does it uh, not happen? Um, the, the entire discussion about the carbon footprint uh, in itself, while certainly an important aspect, I also wonder uh, if it is really um, the only issue we have to consider uh, when we think about cities. And again, it's Hollywood uh, that probably most uh, explicitly uh, announced uh, that, that probably um, the, the plan of the city is rather pointless this year announced to be the end of the world. Um, with the movie in which um, uh, tsunamis, tornadoes, uh, and earthquakes uh, rip everything uh, apart. Now we're coming to the, to the ultimate conclusion, smart cities, how uh, smart do cities need to be? And when they're finally smart, obviously everything is good. Um, th these are not my definitions. These are things you, you find when you, when you try to understand what, what people um, define smart cities as. Um, and somehow I thought um, th this was one of the things at its simplest, think of smart cities as energy efficient, consumer focused, and technology driven. And I wondered if one wouldn't need to reformulate uh, these statements um, if we want to get closer to the core of the issue, that it could be integrative, human focused, and socially driven. Um, so that we're not only talking about technology, data, and management of both, but that we're actually talking about the environments we maybe want or, or should uh, live in. The smart city has many smart components, and in the end, I think the very most important of all these components is probably still the smart human being, because a smart city could never work if the people were dumb, um, and if they wouldn't know how to use their smart city smartly. So in a, in a big way, I think we come back to a very uh, fundamental and, and maybe very difficult problem smart cities or smartness generally is probably about education. And the question about how do we build education into all our ambitions um, uh, and, and how does the society, again, not focus increasingly on a very marketing slogan-driven uh, 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 focus on, on sustainability or a very technocratic form of sustainability, but really also a sense of social sustainability. Probably the smartest city ever was this one. Um, again, uh, Hollywood provides us with everything we need to, to speak about it. Um, you, you might remember the Truman Show, um, the, the perfect city in harmony, everything efficient, life is great. Uh, but obviously, where, where is the, the desire or the fantasy? And actually, where's the trouble? And in how far can we understand ourselves not only as problem solvers, but also as problem creators? Because maybe our life would be terrible and boring if there weren't real problems uh, in our lives. I want to show a few um, projects that I've been uh, working on over the past decade um, that maybe uh, I, I want to present as, as prototypes, as um, attempts to redefine um, what either uh, uh, systems of planning or systems of, of, of architecture could offer and how they um, define their role uh, in their respective context. Um, a city model uh, that we worked on for Southeast Asia um, and developed in a way confronted us with a very uh, typical um, uh, issue. Uh, Developer-driven um, investment um, resulting immediately in the highest possible uh, plot ratio and densification of the site. It's about commercial exploitation, but it is certainly about uh, an issue that we generally face as urbanization increases, density increases. So how could you actually design a city um, that was completely out of context to everything surrounding itself, that was uh, be between five and ten times an increase of density uh, to its own context? 
um, what that would have meant in, in most uh, um, uh, answers and ways would have been a highly efficient, organized, orchestrated uh, uh, grid uh, of, of a city uh, that again as a controllable network and as a kind of defined entity uh, would insert this, this sense of high efficiency um, in this context. But I thought that the disparity simply of a low density environment, but also of the way that people actually lived, the, the culture of a tropical uh, environment, a tropical city, um, could basically not work with that. So the question was, how much control do we have to insert or how much freedom do we want to maintain? And the proposition uh, in this case was um, to, to go to an even more extreme model, to take the high density and make it ultra dense, but by densifying it even further to start to liberate parts of the plan that we would basically exclude from our own scope, that we would withdraw from uh, um, the, the realm of investment and, and um, financial control, and that we would, so to speak, surrender back uh, to, the, to the people and community. We developed a series of, of uh, dense, uh, high, high dense typologies of various functions that were required, and then basically placed them as floating islands um, into a network of basically um, an uncontrollable green uh, tropical mass that would um, uh, intertwine itself with um, its surroundings, but that would also simply form a space of freedom uh, and control uh, and, and non-control um, within uh, the, the islands of, of capital, uh, if you like. So there was a sense of uh, setting the tropical versus the modern, setting the, the architectural uh, intervention versus parts that we would actually leave open. There was a sense that um, all these pieces, because of their scales and because of their um, uh, f functional control, would be highly interdependent. So it was not the idea of islands that had nothing to do with each other, but it was actually the idea that every island only could function and exist in connection and relation to the other islands and actually um, through uh, the texture of what, of what connected it. And the point of this was really to suggest that maybe um, while we are always trained to rationalize things and control things, um, there was a real importance in leaving things uh, to other definitions, to improvisation and to openness and to a sense of self-governance within the city. A second project um, that kind of goes uh, a scale down um, and th that I would uh, label as a community, a housing complex um, in Singapore, um, over uh, 1,040 apartments in a single complex to be planned. Um, the site actually outside the city, part of a large green belt. Uh, the client um, approaches us and basically says, well, we have a 24 story height limit so we would like you to do 12 towers, 24 floors, and place those there. And the result would have been something like this uh, in the middle of nowhere. I found the idea utterly absurd. I also uh, thought that um, what, what, what exists as space between uh, this, this gridded tower uh, city is exactly the problem of, of the non-space. Uh, every building understood as an object, but not um, a development or a city understood as a texture of actual spaces. So what, what we did was basically collapse the towers, threw them on top of each other, stacked them up, and created a system um, of horizontal bars um, that by stacking them up formed a series of uh, six internal and several peripheral courtyards. And we could double the uh, distance between the buildings. So on one hand, increase privacy, but at the same time, um, provide a, a huge eight hectare large uh, network of, of public spaces on the ground, communal spaces, uh, gardens, um, uh, and, and facilities um, in those very open and, and permeable um, defined spaces. So the, the whole ground actually became this network um, of, um, of shared spaces and a true sense of how a community could exist both within their privacy of the apartment, but also within a, a really complex environment of various degrees of, of spaces. We did things um, also on the ecological environmental side, sun studies, self-shading, uh, daylight studies, uh, optimization of facades, etc. But in a way, what, what is maybe still 
the most important aspect of the project is to introduce a stratification of um, social uh, uh, spaces from the very private to the very communal um, as things stack up. And simply by converting a vertical typology into a horizontal typology and by greening in those roof terraces um, and other horizontal areas, we were able to achieve um, 120% per, green of a site that would have been without any building maximum 100% green. So we could, in a way, increase the amount of outdoor, and it's, it's not simply about the green in terms of ecology, but it's the green here as a representation of inhabitable space by the people that live there, and about offering extra, something extra, and about, uh, in, in a way, prioritizing the spaces, uh, not only the spaces that you sell and buy and own, but actually also the spaces that you share uh, in a development, apart from rather dramatic um, uh, uh, spatial, spatial moments of the project. And you have to realize this is a project that is uh, about one or two levels above social housing. So we made this possible at a very low end, actually, of the uh, financial spectrum um, of what, uh, what building costs in Singapore. This is an image uh, of it um, two months ago. Um, it's a project that is actually becoming true by the end of uh, next, or by mid next year, this project will be completed and I think uh, really suggest a very different sense of how we could uh, generate spaces that are about living together and not only living apart from each other. Another project um, takes the community into the vertical. Um, a project uh, uh, in Malaysia, a building actually right next to the Petronas Towers, um, and uh, with a plot ratio of, of 12 to 14, the architects in the audience would know what that means. Um, but it's an extremely highly densified uh, 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 project um, where we have to cram an enormous amount of program onto a tiny, tiny site. And in fact, actually, four different independent programs. It's housing, offices, uh, uh, hotels, retail. So it's really a kind of small piece of, uh, of city. The developer asked for two towers on the site. And I said, like, I don't think we should do a mini twin next to the maxi twin. You can only look bad uh, if you do that, um, apart from the fact that the site is simply too small to fit two towers. If we only did one tower is a bit of a problem too, because actually there's multiple ownership in the building and they needed different parts. So the idea was um, to make a building that was not singular, but that was actually multiple, uh, and that would take multiplicity, um, first of all, as a, as a kind of spatial configuration and basically um, um, dismantle the building into several parts that then are rejoined um, and that start to stack up on one another that give each piece an independent and most ideal floor plate, for example, and volume, but at the same time that become a kind of balancing act of pieces that both support each other but also are at the same time distinct uh, from each other. So the three main programs were put into three volumes, um, the residences, the hotel and the offices and everything else was basically sliced into open layers um, that make the other volumes float and stack up and these open layers act basically as an absorber for the city. So the tropical city can enter here the parts of the building that are not hermetically enclosed but that both suck up the energy and the activity of the city, but also project it back out as an image of activity. So the idea was, in a way, very simple to say, the city is great and the street is great. We have cars, we have people, we have shops, we have trees. And actually, it's very exciting that everything is together. When you start to design buildings, you typically start to separate everything. The cars have to go into a car park, nobody should see them. The shops are here, the shopping mall is typically a huge inert hermetic block at the bottom of the building that actually doesn't connect the building to the city but separates it from it. And here the sense was, why don't we take these elements and simply start to continue them into the tower? So a system of spiraling pedestrian uh, circulation and retail, um, a second system like a double helix, a spiral for the cars that would intertwine and coexist. And then we bring back in um, a continuity of the tropical landscape um, of the city and create a completely open um, and almost brutal mix um, uh, that uh, both accommodates the, the tropical city but also projects it back out. And it's really, it's a mix that also 
embodies the sense of multiplicity in a different way. You, you, you are certainly aware Malaysia is, is a very multicultural uh, society. It's one of the very few places, I think, that if we look at the world as a whole, um, that different religions, uh, Muslim, uh, Chinese, Malay, exist in, in quite great harmony. And, and the thought was, why do we not celebrate the, the togetherness of the different cultures uh, in this building and rather very often the Muslim prayer rooms are put into kind of janitor closet-like conditions in the last corner of the building. And we, we made features out of all of these things. We have a Chinese food court with the Muslim prayer rooms, swimming pools, gardens, cars, retail, shopping. And it's really about the, the urban energy um, that we wanted to continue in the building. And as you move through, you can see the city outside. You can see cars move through. So it was really a sense of bringing things back together rather than segregating and separating them. Part of that we lifted up into the sky um, at the uh, junction of the three pieces to also open um, the, the views uh, to the public and in a way make a building that was initially planned as a fully privatized entity uh, um, accessible to the people and the city again. So while building to the big icon, it was in a way about not necessarily being iconic, but suggesting a set of very different architectural qualities of how to address the city, how to open up a building to the city and connect it uh, to its activity. The final project I want to show, uh, probably one that uh, uh, most of you know, um, the CCTV project uh, in, in uh, Beijing that I've been doing together with uh, REM for the past 10 years and that we recently completed. To think of, to, to think of this as a, as a single entity, yet as a collective, you have to realize this is a building that will be inhabited by about 14 to 15,000 people uh, on a daily basis. So it exceeds the scale of what we can usually comprehend and understand. So I actually had my students cut 14,000 little sticks and glue them on a model simply for ourselves to to start to comprehend what scale we were dealing with. Another important thing was like, as we were drawing the plans at some point, um, I, uh, I started to measure things out and told my office that the elevator core that we were planning for this building was the size of the entire office building we were occupying um, with our architecture firm. And I think sometimes you have to indeed be very literal and almost playful with, with these self-confrontations to possibly comprehend what you're doing. But obviously to understand the building, as a huge collective and as a space inhabited by people, but also as a scale that, uh, again, is maybe uh, not the easiest to comprehend. One CCTV equals four canary wharves. So if you would actually unfold this building, you would have a 750 meter tall building. Um, the difference to the Burj is that it goes like this. So this building uh, actually is far bigger, larger, in terms of its floor area than the tallest building uh, in the world. The site, um, uh, large enough to comfortably park uh, 29 uh, Boeing 747s uh, on it. So yet again, uh, an issue of scale um, for us to comprehend what we were doing. When I came to Beijing um, a bit more than 10 years ago, April 2002, the city planners uh, showed us this image and said, um, now we have three of these towers, but in 15 years, this is how it will look like here. So the only certainty we had was um, to build in a context that would be all about verticality and all about the skyscraper. And obviously this raised very explicitly the question of what the skyscraper was or what the skyscraper could be. It was also historically a very interesting moment because for the first time in history, uh, uh, exactly 10 years ago, Asia had built more skyscrapers than the West. So a typology invented uh, in the West in America had in a way more successfully suddenly been adopted by the East and by Asia as its own uh, um, yeah, symbol of, of, of triumphant modernization, if you like. But it also asked the question, what could an Asian skyscraper be? Or how could a skyscraper maybe suggest things other than what it seems to be about, which is verticality and height? And we felt it was a very important statement to make at that point, um, as the, the whole world was essentially talking about if Burj Dubai would now be 800, 818, or 828 meters tall, to say that maybe height alone is not enough, because obviously, anyway, two years later, somebody else built something taller. 
and this very simplistic uh, embedded uh, uh, principle of hierarchy of the taller the better or the top better than the bottom um, we wanted to subvert. So we basically took the skyscraper and bent it back into itself and said, maybe we could think of it as something totally different, as a loop, a system that no longer has a beginning or end, that in that, in that sense no longer embodies an explicit hierarchy, uh, but that would really be uh, also about a system that engages space in a different way, doesn't suck it up in a single needle that goes skywards, but that from various points uh, um, of, of, of view in the city, starts to define space, engage space, sometimes in stable and sometimes in very unstable ways. The idea was to create a system of a collaborative structure inside, a loop of interconnected activities where all aspects of television making would come together. This is the building for China's uh, national broadcaster, uh, uh, China Central Television. So we wanted to bring uh, news, broadcasting, program production, um, offices, administration, research and training, everything back into one single system in which people would suddenly become physically aware again of what they were actually doing together. And while we are talking the, the, uh, about the happiness of um, interconnectivity and, and uh, digital uh, learning, communication and everything, it's very interesting that when you actually talk to a company like this, you realize that basically not a single employee has any clue about what the company is really doing and what what, what they are doing contributes to what uh, a final product is. This is obviously much more, this is a general problem in our society that fragmentation increases dramatically. This is even more extreme for a media organization where the product is no longer physical but virtual. And the idea was indeed to bring back together physically what in a way process-wise seems more and more disconnected from each other. Um, if you look at this image, uh, I, I think it's, it's maybe one of my favorite images because it simply resonates on a completely different level. If you Im uh, remember your time at high school in biology classes when you saw an open body with organs and hearts and lungs and circulatory systems, so suddenly to, to simply think of a building as a certain life form, as an organism um, that in itself uh, takes on a life beyond uh, where, where the, the interactivity between the components actually makes what, uh, what the thing is really about and not simply the design of light, matter and space. And if then you start to dissect the entire piece and reassemble it, um, you can identify that it's a series of uh, technical clusters for news uh, uh, broadcasting program production that then intertwine with a series of social and communal clusters. Canteens, restaurants, cafeterias, chat rooms, and a whole series of informal spaces uh, for, the, for the employees to exactly do what we said, come back together and become physically aware of each other's existence, but also obviously have the opportunity to communicate in different ways uh, as such. All of that threaded together with paths of circulation that, uh, again, explore the loop in which you always have the choice if you go this way or that way and what kind of um, other encounters you search uh, along your way. This was part, um, we, we designed also uh, the 5,000 interior spaces uh, for the building. And simply as, as part of that, um, we developed a series of, of figures, of personas, um, uh, an administrative staff, control room director, actors, and all the various different types that it would inhabit the building and kind of traced them through the building and tried to see where would they, where would they meet, where would they, how would they circulate, and what would be the actual experiences of the human being throughout the structure. This was actually part of an exhibition um, that I uh, designed with the Museum of Modern Art in New York and Beijing, in which we tried to uh, really communicate those issues. Then we went back to the client and said, look, it, it has never happened that a TV station actually inhabits a single building, because they typically grow over time, and it's maybe only uh, in a place like China uh, where you can do something from scratch. That's the only caveat to the uh, previous title on the, on the sheet. Um, and, and we said, now that we have brought all these things together, there's also an incredible educational opportunity really in this. Why don't we make accessible and maybe visible as much of this as we can to a public and to visitors? So we proposed a visitor's loop to go through the building um, that would explore both the architectural 
uh, kind of features. These are images of the, of the main entrance lobby uh, of four floors, uh, basement three with a direct connection to the subway station, which was the first time ever to coordinate that uh, in Beijing between the authorities to really greatly improve the, the ease of using public transport uh, for such a high density hub. Uh, the canteens, uh, offices, but also the, the broadcast control room with views into how the technology actually produces in real space what you see on TV. This is actually only one side, it's a double-sided space like this. Uh, and from this building, um, they're able to broadcast uh, 250 to 300 channels simultaneously. So uh, again, in terms of numbers, um, it sort of exceeds most of what we know. The most exciting part is no longer the top of the building, but it's obviously the tip of this uh, overhang. It projects 75 meters out horizontally uh, in 180 meters height. Um, and you can see those uh, three little circles uh, in, in this space, which again will be accessible as a media museum to the public. But here you can actually stand on a floor of glass. And um, while, while you think it might be scary, uh, the interesting thing is that the city is so far below you that it becomes very calm and quiet. So it's actually quite easy uh, to step onto it. Um, so you, you look down and you see the building that you're standing on, which is no longer below you, but sort of besides you. These are a few simply perspectival shifts um, that happen in the building. Um, the building took a decade uh, to complete. Um, it was completed a few months ago, and its first uh, real full mission was indeed to broadcast live the London Olympics uh, to the whole of China, um, which uh, it, it, it did. Um, and in many ways, the building has become part of the city uh, in more or less harmonious or sometimes uh, bizarrely um, different uh, ways. And you can obviously see what it means when cities and countries develop at such breathtaking speed that the disparity can be large. Um, it has not only created uh, a few uh, spots in the city where permanently around the day you can find uh, photographers uh, photographing it, but it also started to really take on a life completely beyond itself. It started to change the entire um, commercial environment. Property prices with view onto the building uh, sort of jumped double. So every uh, developer sort of only advertised with this. Uh, buildings that were half the size suddenly come as brothers double the size. Even uh, if you live outside town, you can still have a kind of <laughs> glimpse above the horizon. Um, some, some people even thought it would be better in Shanghai. This is a view of Pudong, uh, to, to put it there. Um, artists had much better ideas than us, but uh, still so far it didn't, yeah, the, the engineers simply were not good enough yet. Um, it also became a wedding cake, um, en engineered by a bakery shop uh, next doors. Um, not, not so easy to build the overhang, actually, as a cake, uh, if, you, if you think about it. Um, but, but maybe most importantly, that uh, I think what happened to the building is that it was not only, it, it obviously became hugely controversial, um, but it really sparked a discussion about what, what architecture uh, could be and what role it could play in a city. And I quite like this image because it suggests that you could think of, thing of even of buildings as characters uh, and not simply as uh, techno technological entities or, or enterprises. And... Um, I think the, the ultimate, um, the ultimate uh, moment of it was when um, it appeared a few years ago in The Simpsons, um, and we realized we had finally made it, uh, that uh, we no longer had to worry about our building. Um, it was part of a contest of being the greatest icon in the world, but obviously lost to Taj Mahal. So the, the building was not about the tallest, and as I said, it's, it's actually so big that I think what is most interesting about it today when you go to the city is how small it is. It's certainly a big building, but if you realize how much bigger it is than basically everything else that exists, I think that the greatest achievement uh, in a way for us was to make it rather small. Because again, if you would unfold it, it would be three times the most extreme piece that you see uh, in, in this drawing. And I think that's what's uh, rather fascinating about it. I want to conclude um, with things that maybe um, next to all the big architecture are, are maybe sometimes even more important. This was a floating uh, cinema I designed uh, in Thailand. Um, the idea was simply um, 
to put people uh, onto the ocean as we watched movies. Tilda Swinton curated, uh, together with Apichat Pong, um, the movies, and uh, it, it was a kind of installation built by local fishermen um, of the island to use the techniques that they usually uh, built their lobster farms with and say, why don't we reinterpret that and convert it into a stage and platform for fun? So we had uh, screenings there and later um, uh, the piece goes back to the community um, for them to, in a way, uh, think of their own, own abilities and their own techniques and what they do every day in a different way and use it maybe in, in a way to enjoy their own things. We also brought it, it traveled to, to Venice, uh, was there as part of the Architecture Biennale a, a few weeks ago. And with this, I want to thank you.